The title of uh, tonight's um, talk is America, um, have we crossed the Rubicon? Let me begin by um, quoting uh, Hamlet, if I may. Uh, Act 1, Scene 4, 87 to 91 lines. We see on one side um, the ghost and Hamlet exiting, and in camera on this side, from this side of the stage, Horatio and Marcellus. And Horatio says, uh, he waxes desperate with imagination, and Marcellus, let's follow, it's not fit thus to obey him. Horatio, have after, to what issue will this come? Marcellus, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Horatio, heaven will direct it. Marcellus, nay, let's follow. They both exit. Our own woes in our own Denmark began some 20 years ago. The climate appeared different then. We were an empire at its near zenith. But something was afoot. Some of us watched, beady-eyed, for events to unfold. Unfold they did. Forces that were major were already at play once the Berlin Wall collapsed. Students, acolytes, and admirers of Leo Strauss, the controversial German-trained American political philosopher and classicist, led one such force. While some Leo Strauss's work cautioned against polluting philosophy with values and judgments, they inspired his followers to cook up neoconservatism designed to inject moral imperatives into the very marrow of American polity. Thus began the romancing the rhetoric. By the 1990s, neoconservatives have crept into the Bush senior administration, actively redefining foreign and domestic policy as a battle of norms and values a fight between evil and good. Ten years later, the neocons returned after an eight-year executive hiatus to firmly roost in several sinecures in Washington. Believe it or not, they called themselves the Vulcans. The world were then split asunder between them, the evildoers, and us. Then the President George W. Bush shared this view, and that did not help the cause of pluralism and complexity in politics, nor did his faith-based conduct, which he publicly avowed while President. For good reasons. Both calcified liberty is a binary. On the other side of the world, plots thicken, thickened to strike at the very heart of America. On the other hand, the world, of course, was complex, muddy, and steeped in shades of grey. It demanded from leaders of major powers in history several things. One, to continuously undergo silent suffering brought about by self-restraint. Two, engage in self-doubt amidst decisive victories. Three, bear witness to eviscerating pain, to induce temperance in leadership. 4. Consider nuanced decision-making fit for global complexity. And 5. Above all, have gobs of charisma with which to win over enemies and skeptics. Some of us, historians and others in the scholarly community, watched the rise of the Vulcans in horror. America was about to regress into medieval rhetoric. The Middle Ages had endured similar discourses. These had resulted in endless conflicts over which value should reign supreme over all others in society. Pure truth, pure goodness, or truth as praxis. That is to say, truth mediated by culture, by exigency, and within a context. The 13th century thinker Ibn Taymiyyah 
had led such discourse, which in essence was no difference than the neocon's assertion, you are either with us or against us. Five centuries later, I might add, Taimiya went on to inspire two forms of us and them polity in the Middle East. One was Saudi Arabian Wahhabism in the 18th century. The other was Salafism and the Taliban, both Puritans in social outlook and both advocates of Jus ad Bellum, that is to say Jihad, war for a just cause. The Quran here was the primary text to guide its practitioners when and where to engage in war and how to judge women in particular and men on a good and evil axis. Europe too had its share of woe-inducing jihadis, particularly during the Thirty Years' War. Who could forget Père François-Joseph de Clerc du Tremblay, Cardinal de Richelieu's diplomatic envoy and foreign minister of sorts? A strong proponent of a Catholic Europe, he fought his opponents tooth and nail envisioning Europe without Protestants. Wolfowitz's avowed vision of a moral world converted by democracy bereft of all Samas was no different than Tremblay's anti-Protestantism. Perhaps more tellingly recent was the Soviet binary view of the world between evil capitalism and its opponents, the communists, who by dialectical definition were seen to be on the right side of history. This view remained in force and unaltered until Khrushchev's rise to power, which ultimately ushered in the concept of peaceful coexistence with capitalism. Last but not least, let us not forget traditional Islam's worldview between the world of peace, the world of war, and wedged in between the world of tactical compromise. The first neocon battle was fought in 1991. It began with bangs and muzzles flashing in Brasso Profundo. We went to war to push Saddam back to Baghdad as we secured our pipes and oil tabs in Kuwait. The former Soviets helped us here. Their weakened presence in the region had left us dominant, and we used this position to what we thought was our advantage. Our strikes on Baghdad, at the borders with Iraq, within Iraq, and in Kuwait were visually clinical. The shock of swift defeat for the Baathists, awesome. We did this by co-opting the free press and US corporations. In one fell swoop, our gatekeepers became sanitized. We saw what they were allowed to see, which they communicated to us as a total digital recall. The United States corporations, on the other hand, turned quasi-governmental, this time to help with logistics at a pre-negotiated price under monopoly conditions. After the First Gulf War, both measures became institutionalized. You see, we had learned our lessons from Vietnam. There, we had left the press free to tell the story of America's conscript as a messy affair. Here, we managed truth with a defined purpose. We fed America tales of heroism, pyrotechnics, in an exceptionally well-orchestrated victory. In Vietnam, the United States Armed Forces carried the full burden of logistics and construction of McNamara's strategy ha strategic hamlets. By divesting these functions to the private sector in our recent wars, we sharpened our forces' tactical abilities, leaving the private sector to support the war effort and profit from it immeasurably. This co-opting of private capital and journalism wormed its way 
into the nation's very flesh and bone. The United States government had shown how truth could be diced, cooked and canned during the fight to repel Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. If the government could do this and lead the way, all the more reason for the private sector to monetize this invention. Why not fox the public with similar tactics by parceling the news to feed into our fears or nurture partisanship among the susceptible? It was in this climate that the 2000 Chad debacle unfolded. Some of us vividly recall those events. How could we not? The nation's political faith in the Constitution was at stake here. As a parental oversight, the Founding Fathers had embedded an electoral college to protect the nation from self-destruction at the hands of mob-driven delinquents. They had not foreseen what the United States was about to undergo in Florida. They may well have taken for granted that those who followed them in positions of power would exercise it judiciously and prove as selflessly as visionaries and as devoted to higher ordered principles as they themselves had been. You see, the Founding Fathers had arrested their faith in the College and the Judiciary as Cartesian upholders of the people's collective will. They expected the US institutions to be unimpeachably fair and act without a whiff of partiality over and above any other competing interest. Instead, when tested over charts, the college and the judiciary tipped the fate of this republic in favour of the college and not in favour of the majority of will. In doing so, I contend, they nicked the fabric of the American Constitution. That nick is still there. It remains ignored. In some quarters of the electorate, its disrepair breeds discontent. You see, the college was created as a device to nurture American democracy to full strength. It safeguarded our liberty unquestionably as long as the broader electorate proved illiterate and savagely undernourished as a citizenry. We have grown since then, I contend, with over 4,400 colleges and universities. 99% of the voting electorate is effectively literate more perceptive than our predecessors, and substantially more robust to withstand game-changing politics. Our economic and social fabric attests to that. You see, 9-11 was a wake-up call for us to change, particularly with regard to intrusions in and support of pop unpopular regimes in the Middle East and beyond. Regrettably, this opportunity inspired the Vulcan-led administration to further the axis of evil theorem. The United States exercised awesome firepower without restraint to export democracy overseas. Rather ironic, don't you think, that since our own democracy had taken a tumble down the legal rabbit hole to seat George W. Bush as our elected president. Thomas Jefferson and his contemporaries at the American Declaration of Independence would probably have acted differently immediately after the Chad episode. They would seriously have considered a second constitutional convention to critically review if not consider reforming the electoral structure for the presidency. They may even have instituted cast iron safeguards over and above what was and still is in place to preempt wars undertaken on 
impulse, personal slight, wars driven by faulty information, faulty premises, and fallacious audacity to export democracy overseas. 9-11 could have strengthened US leadership as a world power by undertaking a variety of measures. One such measure would have been to reach out to enemies and friends, to form partisanships, to form partnerships and fraternities based on differences in a shared, albeit anarchic society. Instead, the US hardened the country's enemies into viperous combatants. We engaged our men and women in deadly enterprises. We also ossified skeptics into enemies with awesome display of US Wehrmacht, hard power. We failed to exercise a soft power, that is to say, convert hardened skeptics with coaxing persuasion. We failed to behave with utmost self-restraint when face to face with sabre-rattling minor players and warmongers. We engaged in renditions of bearded nihilists and pursued a despot sitting on vast oil reserves. The result is that today we face needless challenges overseas. Iraq is in shambles, its leaders grow more corrupt than ever before, the country itself has reverted to classical antiquity, divided between the Kurds in the north, the Shiites in the south, and the Sunnis just above Baghdad's belly button. Afghanistan has returned to pre-Taliban chaos. Factions and feudalism have returned as old wine in new bottles labelled by us. Opium cultivation has resumed. Neighbouring Pakistan teethers on the verge of collapse, and that land has nukes, I might add. Yes, Osama is dead, true. However, he was already dead politically well before 9-11. The technically well-informed in the region, young and old, knew this. They had discovered and tasted of virtual freedom on the net, right in the belly of the beast. From that vantage point, they were wedged between the status quo and privately funded Al-Qaeda under Salafist ideology. That is why the net savvy in the region sought to court independence, pro-Islamic activists and Islamic pluralists. And that is why Al-Qaeda failed to, to gain broad support in the region. To them, neither Al-Qaeda nor the status quo was palatable. They knew that both throttled self-determination. Both dogmatically advocated cultural and social nihilism. Both rigidly adhered to binary thinking. You are either with us or against us. Let me put this differently to you. Both abridged civil liberties and the right to access the net-based global marketplace without government interference. That is why the young and some of their elders took to the net as a grassroots third alternative for regime change. With Osama dead and reforms underway, Al-Qaeda fossilized as a relic of the past, 11th century Persia to be precise. You may recall, as historians, there the Asayun had taken to roaming the mountains of northern Iran as a latter-day Nazgul's. Two centuries later, they were co-opted by the Mamluks to serve them in two capacities, as professionally trained assassins and as cloak and dagger operatives. In other words, Al-Qaeda was a threat 
As long as its cadres remained cloaked in caves behind armoured steel doors, protected by local guardians. Incidentally, these were the same very guardians whose predecessors we had trained to coax the Soviets out of Afghanistan so that we could gain access to gas and petrol reserves in Central Asia. Bereft of Afghan hospitality, Al-Qaeda deflated. It would behoove us to see this for what it is. Else we shall be tempted to be in Kabul beyond what is necessary to protect our privately held assets. Here, I wonder if the corporations should not be told to foot the bill for protecting their assets now underwritten by our publicly funded defense purse. Just a thought. Now, this is not to say that Osama's men do not pose a threat. They do. Of course they do. For as long as the United States backs the status quo in Saudi Arabia and backs unpopular regimes elsewhere, in order to secure a steady supply of oil, we remain exposed to opportunistic terror. The only way out for the US is to engage history on its side and do, after all, what the French did for us in this country during our fight for liberty from Britain. They supported us first ever so delicately, then surreptitiously, and then quite openly when all seemed appropriate. And they did so without snatching from the jaws of victory America's inalienable right to its destiny. We could start the ball rolling by clarifying to interested parties that we stand poised to broker regime change if invited or in the event of a genuine uprising in that empty quarter housing Muhammad's leg legacy. I hazard a guess that for a number of reasons, or summer followers, or summer sympathizers, even Salafists and Muslims from Mindanao to Timbuktu, who are eager to usher modernity in that part of the world, would view America's openness positively. In the interim, though, events have stolen a march on us. The peoples of the Middle East took the reform bull by the horns, without our prompting. Their net-based initiatives toppled several regime, regimes, some without bloodshed, others under hails of bullets and bombs. It is early days yet to assess success in that part of the world. But in toppling despots, its people dispensed with the United States as a beacon for their democracy. Further, US record in propping us some of the very same despots and their military minions inspired little confidence in this country as their amicus curiae. And where it did inspire such confidence, we proved them, proved them resoundingly wrong. We humiliated them ideographically. We portrayed their captured males as curs on leash, begging for mercy. Witness Abu Ghraib. Ultimately, though, the peoples in the Middle East led the way for the United States to follow them when we began our own anarchic march on Wall Street, on Occupy Wall Street. This march was doomed to fail right off the bat. Policies such as No Child Left Behind and the systematic curricular assault on teaching civics, the humanities, and the fine arts in schools and colleges put paid to that prospect. This assault severely etiolated among the young youth, the basal literacy in civics, problem-solving, critical thinking, assessment and evaluation, and the tender art of envisioning 
outside the box. Secondly, a materially significant portion of the American middle class, particularly the alienated segment, proved absent to lead this march of the discontented. The early demise of the Occupy Wall Street was thus assured before it could develop into an action-packed movement for change. Some will argue here that this is what elections are for, to secure change. I have my doubts, and I will tell you why. You see, the Clinton administration left three legacies as it exited the, war, the Oval Office in 2000. A budget surplus, the Lewinsky affair, and the World Wide Web, which was born and raised under its watch. The incoming Bush administration took, his, took this inheritance, borrowed additional cash, and then marched into Baghdad at the cost of more than three trillion dollars. In response to 9-11, it also created the third largest bureaucracy in peacetime history, a 200,000 strong internal security apparatus at the cost of 59 billion dollars. But what is more important is that it then undertook the most important project of re-engineering American society in its history since 1776. This project had two operative fronts, one socio-economic and the other one ideological. The socio-economic front aimed at shape-shifting American society to finance its culture-driven war. This front began with the Bush tax breaks, which effectively see, squeezed wealth from a a America's girth and below. As a result, 85% of America's private wealth catapulted upwards, pushing 80% of the wage and salary owners down to the bottom. Within seven years, that is to say, by 2007, America's socio-economy had been successfully reshaped to, re to resemble an inverted pyramid. Let me put this more graphically. 62 million Americans now had 85% of the nation's private wealth, of which the top 1%, or 311,591 Americans, that is to say, a population the size of the city of Santa Ana, California, controlled 42.7% of America's total financial wealth. The bottom 80% of Americans emaciated financially. Today, they hold 25% of the national wealth. Ideally, this dramatic shift in wealth should have fostered social discontent from the bottom. It is merely did thanks to social networking media, which underpinned the rise of the Occupy Wall Street. Ultimately, as stated earlier, the Occupy Wall Street failed for classically predictable reasons. In the past three years, the national discourse has shifted quite dramatically towards culture and change away from contests over political ideology. The rise of the Tea Party attests to that shift in the national discourse. Other reasons for the failure of Occupy Wall Street included organizational anarchy, lack of a clear sense of direction, lack of strategically minded leadership, and lack of participation by a statistically significant middle class alienated by the post-Bush era status quo. 
What is more important is the second front, as indicated earlier, the ideological one. That front sought to inject into the American electorate values and norms with which to fight secularly defined and secularly engaged cultural pluralism in America. The Lewinsky scandal proved of immeasurable help here, as did the lightning popularity of the World Wide Web and unfortunately the 9-11 attack. In the case of the Clinton episode with Lewinsky over the inappropriate use of a cigar, here was positive proof of moral turpitude by no less than the President. A clear evidence demanding a value-based conservative narrative for leadership in America. The net, on the other hand, provided the best evidence to fight a culture war. You see, the net had liberated access to information for the majority of Americans who now inhabited the bottom of the inverted pyramid. With this liberty also came unbridled exposure to materials seen by the right to be morally reprehensible or socially or culturally corrosive. The texts here ranged from questioning the right to bear arms to advocacy-centered exploration of new faiths, sexual practices and lifestyles, use of expletives in music to convey immediacy of content and reproductive rights. Up to this point, you see, diversity within the United States was existentially spatial and asymmetrically interconnected. In other words, it was a salad bowl of peoples and culture. This allowed room for coexistence between neighbors and between demographic enclaves and provided a breathing room to those preferring isolation or limited contact with peoples of other cultures and races for whatever reason, racist or otherwise. Exposure to alternative cultures races, racial mixes, and outlooks reflective of our own diversity brought across the net by the world outside threatened the status quo, as did everyday exposure to immigration issues and game-changing innovations in science, technology, and above all, religion. The UN United States was now seen by the conservative right to be on the verge of a cultural meltdown. The net had eliminated the benefit of isolation of that existential space vital for the survival of a socio-cultural salad, making the truth of our diversity more immediate and palpable. With the net, we truly faced a real prospect of becoming a part of the melted many, which is what we always claimed we were, a pluribus unum. The 9-11 attack did not help matters here, nor did Muslim rhetoric by Islamic theocracies such as Iran, which labeled America as the great Satan. Both accentuated the urgency for injecting values and norms into the American electorate. Both fed into the ultra-conservative cause, which, while placing the Democrats on the strategic defensive. In particular, it, sorry, it particularly strengthened the religious right, which now had even more reason to campaign for a return to Judeo-Christian values to combat these forces of evil and cultural alienation threatening the fabric of American traditions. Liberals and Democrats, it appears, failed to see this as a valid argument for change in their strategy for a greater and more inclusive America. 
the neocon inspired project would have proved resoundingly successful and may yet be had the Bush administration not overplayed its hand in waging war with heavy borrowing while the middle class saw its prosperity plummet. President Obama tapped into this trifecta of war, debt and discontent by promising change and by securing a firm hold on his party's loyalists as he reached out across party lines to augment his core backers. However, for a variety of reasons, the conservative right had nothing to fear with Obama in the White House. As long as the Democrats focused on change as rhetoric, attacked the right as irrational recidivists driven by ideology and dogma, left intact the structures of campaign finances, and failed to reverse the social pyramid, it held all the cards it needed to continue its march forward. It had money. It had grassroots activists. It had the will to obstruct Obama on several fronts by tapping into the supremely wealthy and their corporate plenipotentiaries at the top of the inverted pyramid. It could effectively bankroll electoral campaigns to back their chosen culture war candidates and focus on independent voters. This way, they could continue scoring congressional gains in midterm elections. Further, using its well placed activists, the conservative right mobilized itself into a counterforce with which to continue the Tannen War on several fronts. One was to protect the ideological parameters of the inverted pyramid. The remainder of the conservative strategy split the money-deprived majority of the electorate between value and faith-based conservatives and the rest. Liberals, political neutrals and socially conservative pluralists. This proved easy to accomplish given that the Democrats had until then failed to capitalize on Occupy Wall Street as a protest movement against the super-rich, but as a cultural movement for diversity and inclusion fighting at the brink of social extinction. In the meantime, in Congress itself, the right the new right successfully blocked any policy and tax initiative that threatened the integrity of the inverted pyramid designed to serve the conservative cause. To this end, all they had to do is ensure gridlock in Washington, consolidate congressional gains with newly brewed Tea Party activists, and wait for the November elections. Now, you may well ask, where are we then? It's clear. In the words of Marcellus, something is rotten in this state of Denmark. The forthcoming election will tell us how rotten. To wit, a Republican victory will accelerate the pace of the culture war against secular pluralism. The nation will march to the ideological right and expand its footprint of conflict in the Middle East. We shall then have crossed the Rubicon. A democratic victory, on the other hand, will leave us where we are, stagnating in gridlock for four years at the margins of the river at Rubicon. Such a prospect could imperil us in the words of the Nobel Prize winning laureate Paul Krugman, that said gridlock threatens the United States to become a banana republic. That is to say, 
a republic whose politicians are too busy denuding opponents of their credibility rather than constructively engaging each other in furthering the greater common good. The third scenario is that the Tea Party infused conservative right returns to Congress severely maimed of numbers. The chances of such a wounded return appear grim. At present, Democrats do not appear to see this imperative, that the electoral contest is a battle in part over culture and values, not just over change. The battle is to empower women, a woman as president, women in equal numbers with men in Congress, women as leaders in all walks of life. The battle, therefore, is not solely against proponents of dogma and faith-based policies. In the event of a resounding victory by the present administration, it may have an opportunity to redress the balance of socio-economic inequities, but it will have to act with lightning speed. Otherwise, the prospect of returning to gridlock will increase as we near midterm elections, which will provide an opportunity for the conservative right to come back, and this time with renewed and unmitigated vigor. Should we be faced with another four years of gridlock? I wonder. What is to become of us? With the rise of the net, the persistent bickering among politicians and party apparatchiks, an increasing social disconnect amidst us, a nationwide disillusionment with politics, there does seem to be a need for a paradigm shift. In days bygone, it used to be, it's the economy, stupid. We then gave change a chance. I wonder if today it is not its culture, stupid. If so, then the age of political ideology may well be over. In fact, if that is the case, then should we, the people of the United States of America, consider with the help of technology a magna Vox Populi. By that I mean 311,591,917 citizens of this republic come together as a pluribus unum convention to talk about who are we as people and then perhaps address some of the issues raised in this talk. Of particular concern would be issues exacerbating the present state of our disunion. Electoral reform aimed at direct democracy, finance campaign reform, reform of the judiciary as a value and culture neutral right, a culture neutral bench with term limit appointments, civil, personal and reproductive rights, right to bear arms perhaps, and the place for religious narratives in American public life and public policy. We have ample evidence to suggest the need to undertake such an enterprise given our recent historical past. Let me elaborate. The Electoral College during our crucial period in history failed to deliver us what the majority had voted for. The judiciary proved wanting of visionary supra-partisanship during Chadgate. The restraints placed on the executive that safeguarded us to go to war on unproven fallacies proved too weak to protect us from embarking on foreign crusades. 
further. The inversion of wealth resulting from tax policies asphyxiates opportunity for social ascendance. The culture wars threatened the, the text of American secular pluralism. God, as a narrative in public policy, threatens to either determine the course of reproductive rights or silence discourses on human rights, human origins, and on the advances and applications of science and technology. Even the right to bear arms, I believe, has already traversed its original intentions. From a right birthed in a trough of exigency and need, to a right born out by an influential trilogy of culture, testosterone and ersatz justice. The present structure for financing elections allows the might of money to manipulate collectively the popular voice of the Republic. The list continues ad nauseum. If these issues lead us to revisit and revise any or all aspects of the Constitution, so be it. If these issues mean convening the largest meeting of people that the Republic has ever seen in its history, so be it. Rather that than continue with gridlock. Depending on the election results thus far, our democracy may well need us to imagine the unimaginable. Resorting to magna vox populi as a cultural artifact to break the deadlock is one such idea. Thomas Jefferson would agree with the spirit behind such an idea, and we owe that much to the Founding Fathers. Not to recognize the perils we face is to fall silent. Sentient leadership and sentient citizenship urges us not to. I say this to echo Reverend Martin Luther King. A time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for me at least, and perhaps for some of you. These then are the views of a citizen of this republic from the canyon below. May the power of its people watch over all of us. Good night.